midterm elections. Congressional Republicans propose an agenda to win in November. What's included in their commitment to America? Abortion comments. How President Joe Biden describes the teachings of his Catholic faith. March for Martyrs. Learn about an event to intercede for persecuted Christians around the world. And prayer to Our Lady. A children's introduction to one of Pope Francis's favorite devotions. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, September 23rd, 2022. Thank you so much for being with us tonight on this Feast of St. Padre Pio. I'm Tracy Sable. Today, Republicans in the U.S. House unveiled their plan, which they say will support the U.S. energy industry, fight crime, and combat illegal immigration. It is part of the GOP's commitment to America as they seek to gain the upper hand in the November midterm elections. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us from Monongahela, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh, with more. With the backdrop of an HVAC production company, more than 30 House GOP members led by leader Kevin McCarthy delivered their agenda for America. They hope by delivering a unifying message to Americans that it will seal the deal for them to take control in the upcoming midterm elections. We want an economy that is strong. That means you can fill up your tank. You can buy the groceries. You have enough money left over to go to Disneyland and save for a future. But the paychecks grow, they no longer shrink. The House GOP plan consists of four pillars, creating an economy that's strong, a nation that's safe, a future that's built on freedom, and a government that's accountable. Republicans say they will fight inflation and lower the cost of living by cutting taxes and regulations. They say it starts with U.S. energy independence. Because you know what drives everything? It's not just what we put in our gas tank, but abundant, affordable, and efficient energy and all of the above strategy, that's what drives the quality of life that Americans have come to know and enjoy. Republicans also say they will secure the border through technology and hire hundreds of thousands of officers. Catholic Congressman John Katko was put in charge with that. The cartels are getting enriched by billions of dollars a month, and they're strengthening their, their, their hold on corruption issues, not just in Mexico, but all over Central America. And to me, if we don't get a grip on the border, uh, we are never going to be able to help Mexico and really help these people from being exploited. And that's a real, real concern. The plan calls for improving health care and giving parents more say in their kids' education. Congresswoman Julia Letlow is a former educator. I think the pandemic brought to light, I'm a mama, it brought to light what our children were being taught because we were stuck in a room virtually, first time for a lot of us seeing the curriculum. And a lot of us were astounded with what we saw that our children were being taught. Safeguarding religious liberty, Second Amendment rights, and upholding free speech, along with protecting the lives of the unborn and their mothers, are top priorities. That they support abortion on demand all the way up until birth, paid for by taxpayers. So there's a real sharp contrast. Uh, I think this is an issue they've overplayed. They really think they're going to win on this issue. I think they're going to lose on this issue. Republicans also tell me restoring the people's voice is vital through accountability in the election process. They say through the use of voter ID and other reforms. In Pennsylvania, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the White House is slamming House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy and the GOP's commitment to America. They specifically warn that women's health could be in peril. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, President Joe Biden, a Catholic, has ripped U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham's proposal to ban abortion at 15 weeks. And just this afternoon, with the midterm elections moving in fast, the president kept up the Democrats' line of attack. President Joe Biden speaks before the National Education Association in Washington. And now nearly half the states in the United States of America have either passed a ban on abortion or will shortly. And in many states, abortion is already banned even in cases of rape and incest. A fundamental change. Ratcheting up what's at stake, the president warned. So in 46 days, America is going to choose. If Republicans win control of the Congress, abortion will be banned. 
He said he'd veto that. And just last night, at a Democratic National Committee reception, the president said incorrectly that a proposed 15-week abortion ban does not make exceptions for rape and incest, adding, I happen to be a practicing Roman Catholic. My church doesn't even make that argument now. But the catechism of the Catholic Church states, since the first century, the Church has affirmed the moral evil of every procured abortion. This teaching has not changed and remains unchangeable. Direct abortion, that is to say abortion willed either as an end or a means, is gravely contrary to the moral law. And with the elections just weeks away now, National Right to Life President Carol Tobias recently wrote, If Democrats maintain control of the U.S. House and pick up additional seats in the Senate, what does the future of America look like? death for millions of our littlest brothers and sisters as Democrats pass measures that have little public support but which satisfy their pro-abortion allies. Meanwhile in the press briefing room today. It's not just national ban on abortion. We're talking about uh, privacy, we're talking about contraception, we're talking about marriage. That is what uh, extreme Republican officials are trying to do. Also in his speech today, the president said in his words, mega Republicans control the Republican Party right now, but also clarify that not all Republicans are mega Republicans, but critics say that's just being divisive. Nevertheless, the president is keeping up on his attacks. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Now, several regions in Ukraine are voting on a referendum whether to become part of Russia. The balloting will continue until Tuesday in Russian-occupied areas. A similar process took place in 2014 when Russia invaded and took control of Crimea. Ukraine and the West are condemning the election as rigged to give to Moscow a reason to annex these regions. There are fears of a pro-Russia result, which could escalate the ongoing seven-month war. Meanwhile, at the United Nations in New York, the Vatican Secretary of State met with Russia's foreign minister. Cardinal Pietro Perilin held discussions with Sergei Lavrov on the sidelines of the General Assembly. Their dialogue is part of the Holy See's diplomatic effort to end the war in Ukraine. While the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops condemns Russia's threats to use nuclear weapons, Bishop David Malloy writes, any threat made to use nuclear weapons reminds us of their heinous nature and disastrous consequences for all of humanity. Let us continue to pray for the leaders of the world that the hopes and dreams we share in common for our peoples will triumph over the tempers and injustice wrought by this war in Ukraine. An American aircraft carrier is in South Korea today. The USS Ronald Reagan is joining military exercises to offset North Korean nuclear threats. It is the first deployment of a U.S. carrier for drills since 2017. Meanwhile, Vice President Kamala Harris will visit South Korea next week after attending the state funeral for Japan's slain former prime minister. Well, the government of Nicaragua has recently expelled a community of Catholic nuns. The religious sisters of the cross were devoted to prayer in Managua, where the local bishop is now under house arrest. The sisters are now safe in Mexico. The community blames the Ortega dictatorship for not renewing a permit for their residents. Well, tomorrow in the nation's capital, people will gather to bring attention to the plight of those being persecuted around the world for their faith. I've sat in the desert camps of people who have been imprisoned, persecuted, and pushed out of their homes. Their crime, the practice of freedom. March for the Martyrs begins on the National Mall. Attendees will walk to the Museum of the Bible for a prayer service and to listen to speakers, including survivors of Christian persecution. We go now to the founder of the March for the Martyrs, Gia Chacon. Gia, welcome back. Great to see you again. Uh, tell us more about tomorrow's event, how many people you're expecting, and also about some of the speakers. Yes, well, Tracy, we're expecting over a thousand Christians of all denominations and all ages to gather as one voice for the persecuted church on the National Mall. It starts at 3 p.m. We have an incredible lineup of speakers. Ennis Cantor Freedom, the well-known NBA star and human rights activist, is joining us, as well as Pastor Andrew Brunson, who is a survivor and uh, of a political prisoner in Turkey. 
He'll be sharing his powerful testimony with us, as well as Father Simon Asaki and Esther Jung, who is a survivor of persecution in China. That's just a few of our amazing speakers that we have planned for tomorrow. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be an amazing event. Um, for those who aren't that familiar with it, talk to us about why you decided to start this initiative. Absolutely, Tracy. Well, Christians are the most persecuted religious group. And I think when American Christians hear that, we're shocked. We're, we don't realize what's happening around the world to our brothers and sisters. But the reality is that over 360 million Christians around the world face high levels of persecution. Open Doors releases their world watch list every year. And uh, we see that consistently for five years, Christian persecution has continued to increase. Yet, despite this increase, despite Christians being the most persecuted religious group, we hear almost nothing about it in the mainstream media or in our communities of faith. So March for the Martyrs is on a mission to raise awareness about the crisis of Christian persecution and unify the body of Christ around this issue. And Gia, let's talk about some of the places in the world where Christians are really persecuted the most. In Nigeria right now, we are seeing a Christian genocide. I'm sure uh, we've maybe a few of our viewers have read the recent headline of the massacre that happened just in June when a gunman entered a Sunday mass and massacred hundreds of Christians. But the reality is, is that thousands of Christians are being targeted and slaughtered in Nigeria alone. But it's not just in Nigeria. In the Middle East, there's an ongoing Christian genocide. In China, even though there are over 100 million Christians, we're seeing some of the most restrictive uh, targeting and oppression of Christians. And of course, in North Korea, it's illegal to be a Christian in that country. Um, and the situation, even though the world is progressing, so to speak, the, re the reality is that religious oppression is increasing and Christians are the most targeted. And Gia, we're almost out of time, but quickly, uh, what's your hope for tomorrow's event. And if people would like more information about it, where can they go to get it? My hope with tomorrow's event that uh, as Christians unify as one voice for the persecuted, that this issue will be brought to the forefront of the fight for human rights. Christian persecution is a human rights crisis, and it deserves the same level of urgency as any other crisis. And if anyone would like to join us in prayer or in person on the National Mall, you can find out more about the March for the Martyrs by visiting forthemartyrs.com forward slash march. Gia, thank you so much for your time today. Good luck tomorrow. We're praying for you all. Coming up, school choice. A state in New England prepares to reimburse money for religious education. Plus, delving deeply into the profound theology of the Pope Emeritus. Well, the state of Maine will reimburse tuition for students at one Catholic school. Chevers High School in Portland is approved to participate in the state's tuition plan. Students at the Jesuit Prep School will be the first to benefit from the program after a Supreme Court ruling in June, which ordered Maine to treat religious schools the same as other private schools. All theology students of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI have begun their annual meeting at the Vatican. The group has met at the end of each summer since 2008. They are committed to researching the work of Pope Benedict. The theme of this year's gathering is, quote, binding the truth and the development of the church's teaching. Joining us now from Rome is Father Ralph Vyman, who is participating in the meetings. Father, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Can you tell us more about this meeting and also how many people are taking part. Uh, we understand there are even some cardinals who are present. Yes, Tracy, thank you for the invitation. So we're having here a public congress in Rome on the theology of Joseph Ratzinger, and we're focusing on one very important topic, addressing the importance of the binding character of the truth and the development of the church's doctrine. And there are several people attending this meeting, such as Cardinal Kurt Koch, he's the protector of the Ratzinger Schülerkreis, and also other bishops, priests, and so forth. And thanks to you, to EWTN, people from all over the world may participate in this Congress by watching and uh, participating in it and um, following us online in the transmission. And even Pope Benedict told us through his private secretary that he will follow these conferences 
and he is very interested in this topic, which is of great importance. So just to get a certain idea of what we are going to do here in these days in Rome. And you, can you tell us a little bit more in depth uh, about the theme for this year's meeting? Yeah, we invited some outstanding speakers, such as uh, the distinguished Bishop Dr. Rudolf Voderholzer, and he will talk about the Holy Spirit within this process of the development of the Church's doctrine. Then we have Monsignor Markus Crowley. He will talk about the balance, which is always necessary to find between change and then also fidelity. Then we are going to address a very delicate topic, that's the lex credendi and the lex orandi, the law of prayer and the law of what we believe. So that's another very important issue, because if you change one or touch one, it will have an impact on the other. So whenever you change, for example, the liturgy, the way you pray, it will have an impact on the way how you believe. And at the very end, there will be a personal testimony of one of the witnesses of one of the members of the Ratzinger Schüler Christ, who got to know Pope Benedict very well, and he will talk about um, this from a personal perspective. So all this will address the same topic, the binding character of the truth and the development of the Church's teaching. And speaking of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, I'm curious, in what ways um, does he remain relevant today? Pope Benedict had, has written so many books, and also as a professor beforehand, he has published his opera Omnia. And they, these, these writings are an important guidance to find, let's say, the right way to understand the gospel, to understand revelation. And that's what all is about. And Pope Benedict, of course, is very much interested in this topic because it was always very dear to him. He called himself a co-worker, collaborator of truth, and that's what he always wanted to be, to guide us towards the truth that is Jesus Christ. And for that reason, I think his theology is of great importance, and this meeting here in Rome is also very important. Absolutely. Well, Father Weidman, thank you so much for your time today and all you do. We appreciate it. God bless you. Up next, view from outer space. See the rings around a planet that's not Saturn. Plus, how Our Lady unties knots in a way any child can understand. A devotion to Our Lady dating from the 17th century is enjoying a recent surge in popularity. Pope Francis even cited Our Lady a doer of knots last year during his rosary to end the coronavirus pandemic. And the undoer of knots feast day is coming up next week. But what more do we know about this devotion and how may it help even our children? Well, we go now to Sylvia Dorham author of the children's book, Our Lady, Undoer of Not. Sylvia, great to be with you. Thank you for your time today. Um, talk to us a little bit more about Our Lady, Undoer of Not, and also what prompted you to write a children's book about her. Thank you, Tracy. Our Lady, Undoer of Knots is one of many ways that Our Lady reveals herself to us as our helper to help us get to heaven and to bring those that are entrusted to our care to heaven as well. So, of course, as parents, it's our responsibility to help with their education, along with bringing them to CCD and the sacraments and the Mass. So what we want to do is provide good literature that helps children understand that they have heavenly friends to help them on the way. Our Lady Endure of Knots, in particular, is a devotion that came out of Germany. Like you said, in the 17th century, there was a couple that got married and had a very bad relationship. And in those days when you married, you clasped the hand of your spouse and the priest would wrap a ribbon around your joined hands to represent your unity. Well, every time this couple would fight, the lady would take the ribbon and tie a tight knot in it until the beautiful white ribbon was now just a crumpled, dirty mess. And the husband, in a last attempt to save his marriage, went to a priest and brought the tied up ribbon and said, please pray for us. Well, the priest took this ribbon in front of a painting of Our Lady of Snows, and as the story goes, Our Lady untied it and made it fresh and white as new right there. So for us, Our Lady is an example of how when our relationships or the situations in our life are completely out of control, she can help us untie those things. Mm, so beautiful. Um, and what do you think, Sylvia, that children can learn from this story? You know, children perhaps are better at understanding the things of the faith than we are. 
um, ourselves being tied up in the knots of the world. Um, so they have a clarity of understanding that also helps us and reminds us about our own faith. So when you read to your children at night before they go to bed, in that intimate moment of closeness, when you're tired and they're tired and you read them a book and kiss them goodnight, here's an opportunity for you to share the tenets of the faith in a rhyming and rhythmical way that allows the words of Scripture and the truth about who God is and who Our Lady is to really sink down into their hearts so that the times in their lives that come that require more assistance from God, um, they can remember these things that they learned and put them into practice. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the wonderful things uh, about children's books, and when my children were little, I used to do that every night, read them books before bed, um, are the pictures. They love looking at the pictures. Can you tell us a little bit about the illustrator of the book? Uh, her images are really so sweet. They're sweet, and you can tell that she has a Marian devotion by looking at them. This um, Mia Sasser is a homeschooled teenager. She was a teenager when she started doing these books, and I asked her mom if she could please take some time from her academic studies to develop her art through the act of illustrating this book. And she and I have also worked on several other titles about human trafficking as well. But she did so much research that when I said to her, oh, I think maybe we should change the color scheme, she said, no, 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 no. I went back and I looked at the original painting in Germany and I've designed the whole color scheme of this book around the original painting. So at that point I knew that it was time for me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. What else would you like people to know about the book? You know, I think it's important to remember that in our jobs of teaching our children, that if we can use rhyme and rhythm and song to help our children remember the tenets of the faith, they'll stick a lot better. For instance, when we go and sing to Alzheimer's patients, people who can't remember their name or where they're from can sing the full verses of a hymn they learned as a child. And so to give the bits of the faith that we're teaching our children the same longevity, we need to really hide it in their hearts with the use of rhythm and rhyme and music. And Sylvia, also before I let you go, um if anyone would like to get a copy of this wonderful book, um, how can they do so? This book is available at TAN, tanbooks.com, and on other big online book retailers. Wonderful. And any final thoughts before I let you go? You know, I'm so grateful that Our Lady has given us so many ways to help us to understand who she is and to allow her to bring us to her son. So we just ask Our Lady Endure of Knots to please, in these times in which we live, to take us, untie the knots that are in our hearts and bring us safely into the arms of her son. Well, Sylvia, that was beautiful. And thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with us and share your book with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Now, finally tonight, the James Webb Space Telescope is providing a stunning view of the rings around the planet. But the planet is not Saturn. Rather, it is the planet Neptune, seen here along with its brightly reflected moon Triton, which looks like a star at the top. The distant planet's rings were discovered by astronomers in 1984 and confirmed five years later by a U.S. space satellite. This newest image is the clearest since that mission and the first look at Neptune's rings in infrared. Oh, we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.